this. All right, so, so I want to welcome everybody to our uh, second module. And I hope that what we did on Friday has been sort of working in your subconscious now. Um, I'm going to make some recommendations throughout on, on how to apply this. One of the main recommendations that I'm going to have is that practice makes perfect. So the more you refer to these uh, creative thinking tools, the more you find ways to put them to use, the better you will get at uh, using them and applying them. And the more they'll become part of your second nature. So that holds for everything that we're going to do today as well. And um, over the weekend, I sent out a feedback survey. And so far, I've only gotten one response to that from somebody who's not uh, going to be here today. And I want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to complete that feedback survey. Um, and um, so please take a look at it. Uh, if I need to, I can resend it. But uh, we, we would like some feedback from you. And uh, it'll help guide us uh, because when we are doing these, uh, okay, Melanie, no problem. I'll resend it. Uh, because when we're doing these um, uh, workshops, it's good to get some feedback, at, you know, especially as we're doing this in a new format where we're not in person. Maybe there are some things that we should be doing that we're not doing. Maybe uh, we're doing some things that we could do better. So, so let us. Uh... Now, uh, Jessica, it said don't don't complete it uh, now if you're going to do both. If you're going to do both, I just wanted the people who weren't uh, uh, going to be here today to fill it out. So uh, after today, the rest of you can fill it out. Uh, so just to clarify. Um, so anyway, uh, I want to make sure you got it in the first place because I was a little, it was uh, the first time I sent something out using Google Docs, and I was afraid it might have I, I was afraid it might have gone to your spam folder or something. So I'll send it I'll send the link directly uh, through Outlook, and maybe that'll that'll do better. So let's revisit what we uh, what we did on Friday a little bit. Um, in module one, we uh, went over uh, a section on understanding creativity and innovation, and we went over the results of your disc and learned how to, how that um, sort of reflects on your um, creativity. And we got some insight from that. That was the main purpose in that is just to give you a little insight and self awareness. And then we learned an, a general problem solving model that you can apply in most situations. And we took the first part of that and we learned how to define problems. So we covered a lot of ground. And in this module, we're going to learn how to generate ideas, uh, both individually and in a group setting. And we're going to learn a little bit about implementation. And this again is the problem solving model that we, uh, that we looked at. Phase one, problem identification. Phase two, Decision making in which you identify uh, alternative solutions by coming up with ideas and then you choose the best solution. And then finally, the phase three is planning and organizing, which is the implementation phase. And one of the things that we discussed was that, uh, you know, based on who you are as a person, you will probably gravitate to one of these phases more than another. And we talked about, you know, some of you gravitate to phase one, some to phase three. You know, some, some of you are all about the implementation part of it. Uh, some people are all about defining the problem. And that's where I find myself uh, going is to that problem identification phase and, and to a little lesser extent phase two, coming up with ideas. So, um, that's the thing to be aware of. Based on who you are, you're probably going to gravitate to one of one of these more than the others. And this is why it is really valuable to have a group of people who are who are gravitate and have expertise in uh, in one of these phases. So you, if you have people who are really motivated to to be 
you know, problem identifiers, the people who are really um, uh, motivated to come up with ideas and people who are really motivated and energized by the implementation, if you bring them all together and, um, you know, in a, in a situation like this where they understand that about one another, you can really be effective and, and, and solve a wide range of problems. And that's really the goal, to leverage your collective creativity to solve problems. Uh, one of the things that Greg brought up last time was the five whys, and I will send you something about this. This is actually part of a different course that Joan and I have. Um, and there's uh, this is a really good problem finding technique. As a matter of fact, I should probably add this to the uh, the uh, training uh, in general. Uh, the five whys technique is a really good problem identification technique. And it, uh, essentially it's just uh, asking why. When you come, when you have a problem, when you're faced with a problem, ask why is this a problem or why did this happen? And then you do this as many times as it takes till you get to the root cause. Uh, five is a good number, but you might need more, you might need less. And there's an ex a really good example here. So you were late to work today. So why were you late to work? Because your car ran out of gas. Why did your car run out of gas? Because I didn't put gas in it. Why didn't you put gas in your car? Because you didn't have any money. Why didn't you have any money? Because you spent it all over the weekend. So the reason you were late to work was that you spent all your money over, over the weekend. You've identified the root cause of the problem in a, uh, in a systematic way that really digs down. And you can apply this uh, to many, many situations. Uh, and this is an extremely powerful tool. Greg, do you, have you ever used this? Sorry, I had to find my unmute button. Uh, okay. To certain extents, uh, you know, I've definitely seen it used at meetings where somebody identified a problem, said, why, why, mm -hmm. why, why? Uh, mm -hmm. And I've certainly utilized that on children with mm -hmm. limited success. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the workplace setting, it's it's been inter intermittent. I've used it uh, to an extent monitoring as well. Okay. Um, I'm, I will send you a supplement to your workbook that includes this in it after we're done today. And uh, you can add that to your toolbox. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about creative techniques, uh, which uh, we use to generate ideas. And I'm going, to re I'm going to recommend you get this book if you're really interested in delving into this uh, topic further. It's called Thinker Toys, and it's essentially a, a big volume of creative thinking techniques. I've had this book for years, and I've uh, actually talked to the author. Uh, he's a really interesting guy, uh, Michael Michalko. He actually goes into organizations and teaches creative thinking techniques. And, um, a lot of his techniques can be used for problem finding. A lot of them can be used for generating ideas. And then he also has some techs and techniques in here to develop ideas into solutions. Um, so I, if you're really interested in, in learning lots of different techniques, this is the book to get. Um, it's well worth your investment. Um, so today we're going to be going through five different creative thinking techniques that are used to identify problems. I'm sorry, to identify solutions. Um, most of these techniques are uh, help you generate new and different types of ideas by shifting your perspective, but they do so mostly in a systematic way. And so um, it sort of takes you from uh, uh, an adaptive approach to where you're uh, thinking new and improved and helps you generate ideas that are more new and different in a systematic fashion. So they, they can be really, really effective. So I apologize for this awful graphic, but the first creative technique is called the RAP model. And I've seen this called different things. 
um, like uh, most uh, most creative th uh, creative thinking techniques, we'll call this scamper. It's an acronym that uh, gives you uh, just a systematic way of of taking a problem and, and developing solutions. And the model uh, essentially uh, comes out as replace, remove, reorder, amalgamate, amplify, alter, or put to another use. So how we, how we uh, let's say that we had a product and this product has come, it's been out for a while, but we need to come up with a way to sort of revitalize this product. So what could we do to this product? Well, first of all, we could replace things. We could use new materials or components to substitute in to sort of create a new product. We can remove things. We can simplify the product and reduce it to its core functions. Uh, there might be th some things about it that are obsolete, so we can remove them and refine it in such a way that it makes it more efficient, more effective. Uh, we can reorder things. How can you change the order or rearrange the use of the product? Uh, what components can you substitute to change the order of the product? You can amalgamate things. What products or services could you combine to make a new product? Uh, can you integrate things? Uh, can you, uh, uh, what components can you put together to maximize the use? So like a good example of an amalgamating uh, product is uh, just a smartphone. Uh, every time there's a new app for a smartphone, you're, in, you're integrating in new capabilities that, that continue to keep your smartphone useful. Um, so that the, the remove, I want to delve into a little bit more. Um, this isn't in your book, but I wanted to um, put this in here for you to refer to. Uh, and this is, uh, this is called the 80-20 rule. How many of you have heard the 80-20 rule before? Nobody has heard the, of the 80-20 rule? The, eight, the, Pareto, the Pareto principle. Um, Pareto was an Italian economist, and he noticed that there were, he was also a gardener, and um, Nancy, the book was called Thinker Toys, and uh, I can go, I'll go back to that um, uh, here in a little bit. Uh, the 80-20 rule is a means of uh, refining. So uh, Pareto observed that 20% of his plants in his garden produced the most vegetables. And he started noticing that this 80-20 rule, um, where 20% produces 80%, 20% of a thing produces 80% of the value. He started noticing this in, in different scenarios outside of his garden. For instance, he saw that 20% of the population had 80% of the wealth. Um, we'll notice that 20% of, of your sales force is responsible for 80% of your sales. Uh, so these things pop up all over again. 20% of your customers give you 80% of your business. So this becomes a real effective way of implementing the remove. How can you simplify your product and reduce its core functions? What is it about what you're doing that provides, what, what is the 20% of what you're doing that provides 80% of the value of what you're doing? And then you simply remove the parts that aren't as effective, aren't as efficient. You can either get rid of them in entirety or you can farm them out or whatever. But the, the point is you're reducing it to the most effective components by using the 80-20 rule. And the 80-20 rule can be really effective uh, as a real effective idea generator, um, especially if you've been doing something for a long time. There might be things that you're doing that are no longer effective and that the, the th there are some things that you're doing that are extremely effective. And so those things will pop out. The 
20% of what you do that provides 80% of the results or 80% of the value. Burden the hand versus burden the bush idea. That's good, Jessica. And Desiree, this is that's correct. We do use this a lot in the business sector. Um, yeah, and 20% of your clients take up 80% of your resources. Greg, that's a good point. Um, you're you're going to find that the that you you know you've got uh, twenty percent of your clients uh, uh, give you eighty percent of your problems. Uh, there's a there's a credo that at some point you need to use this technique on your customer base and eliminate the customers that are the the twenty percent of your customers that are giving you eighty percent of your problems. Sometimes that's a little difficult. But uh, that's a different application for this. Yeah, that could be that can be very tough in a public service setting. Uh, yeah, uh, some uh, uh, a business can maybe afford to do that, um, but it's very tough in a public service setting to eliminate clients. Then continuing on with the RAP model, amplify. Uh, what features could you add? to amplify the product? What could you change to give it a different look or feel? What components could you add to the product to give it more consumer value? Alter, how can you adapt this product to serve another purpose or use? What are others doing in your industry to adapt and change their products to the market? I particularly gravitate to this tool uh, more than the rest. I am always looking to see what others are doing to find out if we can adapt it. Can we, can we take what, even if it's in a totally different uh, industry sector or, or service sector than we're in, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? And how can we learn from that and adapt it to what we're doing? This is called, uh, in, in different forms, it's, uh, you can call it a best practices exercise. Um, so I, I really like using that. And then put to another use, instead of scrapping it, how can you repurpose it? Uh, is there a way to is there a way to use this idea somewhere else? So using the wrap technique, um, you can you can uh, it, it sort of takes you step by step through an assessment of possibilities. And using this, you can come up with all sorts of ideas. You can really proliferate ideas on uh, how to uh, Take something and reinvigorate it, refresh it, make it more useful. Are there any questions on this? We're not going to do an example with this. Uh, I want this to, to be a tool in your tool belt, but we're uh, going to we're going to we're not going to work through an example on this particularly. Um, the next technique that we're going to use, they call the shoe swap technique. Again. This, could, this is uh, something that, that can be used uh, or that, that can be referred to in different ways. Like uh, I, I've heard this, this uh, different, uh, a different way of, of looking at this is called the six thinking hats, where essentially what you're doing, excuse me, is you are taking the role of a person who, uh, whose role you typically don't have. So you're, you're taking on this role and you're actually adopting their creativity. So the shoe swap technique here involves six different um, personas. Uh, the first is the sandals persona. This is the person who uses intuition to make decisions. The second is the high heels person. This is the person who plays the devil's advocate. Uh, they can uncover what won't work. So they, they can really appear to be negative, but they're actually providing a valuable perspective because they can tear it apart and, um, and force you to look at things in a different way and then uh, help you come up with ways to mitigate. Then there's the slippers person. This is the person who's eager to make everyone happy. They're a people pleaser. Then there's the hiking boots uh, persona. This is the person who is very organized 
and very process oriented. And then the sneakers persona is the person more comfortable with generating new ideas. And the loafers persona is the person who's drawn to the facts and is very logical. So each one of these perspectives would probably look at a problem differently and come up with different ideas. And the, the process here is to learn how to put on these different shoes yourself to help you generate different ideas, ideas that you normally wouldn't have a thought to generate. So we're going to try this technique uh, in our group setting here. And we're going to use this technique to come up with strategies to assess and deal with the problem here on the next slide. I'm gonna keep this uh, graphic up so that we can remember that. Um, the different uh, shoes. So due to budgetary cutbacks, your department is restructuring and reorganizing in order to consolidate workflow. This means that everyone's job responsibilities are being reassessed and will change. So um, think about, oh, and, and by the way, this is also in your workbook, so you can have this to refer to. So use the shoe swap technique um to uh come up with new ideas here and i'm happy to accept your ideas in the form of saying them out loud or or you can write them in the chat box so let's uh start out with the sandals let's inhabit the sandals uh, persona the person who uses intuition and come up with some ideas using you know your intuition using your gut here come up with some ideas um, on how we can implement this restructuring and reorganizing jessica says i need an example Okay, so think about the problem here. Let's read this again. Due to budgetary cutbacks, your department is re restructuring and reorganizing in order to consolidate workflow. This means that everyone's job responsibilities are being reassessed and will change. Desiree, that's right. It's very relative to what's happening right now. You've got employees who are teleworking. Um, You've got, let's say that you're the person who's got to come up with the plan for restructuring and reorganizing and then implementing that. So uh, let's come up with some ideas based on first the person with uh, who would be wearing sandals, the person who uses intuition to, uh, to uh, implement this. Jessica says, I'm too much of a hiker to think like this, okay. When we get to the hiking boots, you can you can chime in. So Alan's got a couple here. One is determine where you think people would be best suited based on their work style and personality and make job responsibilities to be better in line with industry standards. Very good, Alan. Any anybody have a high heels? The devil's advocate here. I think the approach there would be to to look at it and say, well, we know th this person won't function in X capacity, Y capacity, Z capacity, mm -hmm. or to turn it around and and say uh, we have to avoid certain things in order to maintain the services that we need to the clients. Yeah, the high heels person says, no, this isn't going to work. We can't do this. And this is why. This is uh, this is sort of like a different creative thinking technique that we're going to learn here in a bit. Um, where you sort of state the opposite of what you're trying to achieve and come up with ideas on on stating the opposite and then flip those around. But yeah, any other devil's advocate type of perspectives on this? 
Yeah, Sandy, my first thought would have been like uh, Devil's Advocate would say that requires too much retraining and um, uh, to accomplish in any kind of, you know, comfortable time frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how would you. Um, how would you uh, mitigate that? How, how, you know, coming up with that is an issue. How would you mitigate that? Well, see, I, I, I'm the hiker kind of person and, and, you know, um, like Alan, my first thought would be to play to people's strengths and sort mm -hmm. of identify uh, what jobs fit well into their, their strongest skill set. And, um, you know, it's just easier to learn something that's in your skill set. So right. that would be my first thought and how to attack some sort of reorganization. Like I've actually done done exactly this so um and that was my approach is to look at what people um excel at what they like to do and gear their jobs as much as i could to to benefit from that strength okay what about slippers the person who is eager to make everyone happy the people pleaser i think in that scenario you just go around asking people how they envision their jobs redefined Okay, so you 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 give you sort of create buy in by including well, them, including them in the process. I think it's less about creating buy in and more about letting people choose what their their own best option is. Right, the the theory being that people know themselves better than you do. They know what they're interested <laughs> in, and so if you let them make the selection, then everybody's happy, right? Because you get to go for what most interests you or most uh, suits you right anybody have some uh, additional slippers perspectives here jamie says this would allow uh, everyone to make their own responsibilities yeah how about the hiking boots perspective we know we have at least one hiker here, the person who's very organized and process oriented. We have any other hiking boots perspectives on the problem? What kind of ideas would a hiking boots person come up with here? Come on, hikers. See, if we were here in person, I would have a whip and I'd be going, whoosh, whoosh. actually, I'd probably have a table designated as a hiking boots table and the table would be working on this as a group. So perhaps somebody come from the outside like a consultant to review job responsibilities. Okay. Louise says we would come up with the processes and procedures to make this come to fruition. So right, the hiking boots per, hiking excuse me hiking boots person would say we need to have a process to implement this. So we need to develop this process that will get us to where we we need to be. Greg says review the needs and establish a process to review, analyze, and then decide. How about the sneakers person, the person who likes to generate new ideas? So think of something new and different. I see this one is really going back to um, like the crazy idea generation, right? So this is, well, you know, what exactly do we need in the end? How else can we get there? Is that really what we want? Uh, really turning that problem around on its head and, and asking things, what are the core things that we need to do? How, how else can we get there? Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, that's that's good. Uh, one thing um, we might want to do here to to make our time together more effective is for as many of you who feel comfortable 
please unmute and uh, show your uh, videos so that we can see one another like we're in a group. Um, one of the uh, things that just came out here from uh, One of the things that came out from Jamie here reminds me of the uh, exercise that we did on Friday where we were looking at the softball team. Joan got it. And yeah, it's still recording. So um, Joan has to leave us. So everyone say goodbye to Joan. Bye, Joan. Bye, Joan. She says bye-bye. So um, getting back to what I was just saying here, you uh, looking at this as the, the accepting the constraints as, as the part of the problem, or, or looking at the constraints as being the problem, what can you do? So uh, Jamie said, let's take a look at this budgetary cutbacks thing. Uh, Jamie says, we, we need to try to find ways to avoid budget cuts. So in other words, how can we undo these budget cuts so that we uh, don't even have to go through this situation? That's that is definitely an outside the box uh, solution. Um, Alan says, uh, you know, collect examples of other companies who've restructured and been successful. That's good. Okay, let, let, what about this last person, the person who the loafers person who is drawn to facts and is very logical. That person, I would, I would guess, might look for a singular person to, to cut from the staff versus, you know, some of the other ideas we've been floating about redistributing or, um, you know, uh, you know, looking for other ways around the problem. Right. The person who's drawn to facts and is very logical can often be sort of impersonal about about these type of things. So remember, in our example from Friday where we were looking at the softball team. If you use facts and are logical, you're looking to find the, the best 12 or the most worthy 12 people uh, to go to the tournament. So you come up with a way of analyzing their performance or whatever um, without thinking about um, you know, them as people, you're looking at them as, as data and statistics. So if you if you um, if you're drawn to facts and you're very logical, the loafers person would would more likely come up with a more uh, Jamie says very cut and dry approach, a very impersonal, just the facts type approach. Okay, so I did not expect a lot of interaction here because uh, it's often very hard, and since you know. Oh, I see people are still not showing their videos. I'm going to change my view here. So at any rate, um, I want to debrief this because since this is the first time that you've you've seen this, uh, this can be very difficult. So I want to ask you, how hard is it for you to adopt those different shoe styles in your thinking? Um, I think I would be, I could be different things for different problems. Um, because I definitely am more of the person that cares about the employees that are affected. 
-hmm. I wasn't really sure where I fell into that. I'm like, am I the sandal person? It's kind of intuitive that, okay, I'm worried about that. But now I'm like, I must be the slippers. <laughs> I'm not, I feel like in different situations, you could be kind of different. So yeah, I, I just thought I was kind of all over the place in some ways. Definitely not a loafer though. And mm -hmm. definitely not a sneaker. I knew I was kind of up on the other side of the scale. But to apply it, yeah, helpful. Okay, thanks Louise. Anyone else? Similarly, I, I found certain roles a little, certain roles that I had personal examples of in my life easier to try on, I guess. So mm -hmm. I have a I have a high heels person that I work with closely. And so, you know, putting myself in her shoes and and understand understand what she might put forward was much easier for me than, you know, some of the other ones that mm -hmm. I don't have a live example of in my life. So you, you're saying you don't have experience knowing somebody uh, who might wear the different types of shoes other than the one you just mentioned here. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've had some ex more um, currently would be more correct. I mean, I've, I've had those people in the past, but those shoes here to try on than the ones that I haven't seen for a while. Think about um, think about uh, a famous person or a character from a book um, that you might be able to put in those roles that um, that you sort of know just because you know they're famous or you read them in a book, like uh, like the idea person, the person with a lot of ideas, maybe Thomas Edison or Leonardo da Vinci. And what you know about them can give you insight into how they would approach this type of problem. So, um, what did you learn about how other people think? What are your insights now on how other people think? I think, uh, you know, I, I, my takeaway so far from all of the presentation, this part and, um, you know, the, the other uh, section last week was to be more appreciative of those other perspectives. Um, I think I do tend to dismiss um, sometimes other perspectives more so than I should. Okay. Well, my difference is I'm more inclusive. All of these people, these different types of shoes, you have to be a very good listener. And so, therefore, I listen to the different breakdowns of the shoes and the type of people before a decision is made. Because there are a lot of times I may not be thinking like they're thinking. And it builds on whatever my decision would be in the end. Yeah, I think that the more the more these tools that you understand that we go through here, the more it broadens your perspective on how other people might think. We we went through a lot of that as as Jessica suggested. It sort of reinforces this. Um, I didn't know there were uh, so many shoes. <laughs> yeah, I mean there are, there are a lot of different ways that people uh, look at this is, you know, based on their, uh, based on their own personal creativity. Um, everybody sort of has their own method. Everyone sort of, sort of has their own perspective and process for solving problems <clears throat> that you may, that, that you've developed over time, but, you know, it's part of you because it, it emanates from your personality. And that's one of the reasons that I had you <clears throat> take that personality assessment to give you some insight on how your approach here sort of emanates, <clears throat> excuse me, from uh, who you are as a person. Louise says, I have more of awareness of the different styles. That's good. This is, um, this is really, you know, the, the main purpose in, in this training is to, is to create, you know, the awareness of the different styles and the different techniques 
and also to, to sort of connect you in such a way that once you start to learn about these and learn about how others approach problems, you can increase your effectiveness because you can be a, um, a coach or a mentor or an asset to somebody because you bring a different perspective. And they can be a coach, mentor, and asset to you because of their perspective. So how can you use this technique to become a better creative thinker? Can you think of a way that you can apply this uh, right now in your situation? I, I think one of the big takeaways I have from this is that the most effective people are going to be able to float among several of those different methodologies fairly readily. They'll be able to put on the high heels and say, well, here's what we need to toss out because this isn't going to work. And then you, you subject it to the other analyses. Well, why, 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 right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, here are here's the data. What does that tell us? Here's where my gut says and, and how do I balance trusting that versus the data? Okay, good. I, you're right. Um, the more of these uh, styles that you can adopt, the more effective you can become as, as a creative thinker. Sandy, and I would also piggyback on what Greg said and say that, um, you know, if you can, well, I'll just give my, my concrete example. So I have a, a high heel person that I work with regularly. And mm -hmm. my initial response to her is always, why are you putting so many roadblocks in the way you know like because and that's her nature um and you know how i frame that in my mind makes a big difference in uh how we work together or how mm -hmm. progress is made because if i um if i put that into a you know well she's she's foreseeing problems that need address versus what I initially thought was, you're just putting roadblocks into progress. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how I frame that makes a big difference on how um, we work together. That's a great point, Jessica. And I, I would, you know, let me ask you something about this person. Does this person throw up, you know, you just using the, the phrase throw up roadblocks. Let's say that this person is throwing up roadblocks. Is this person following up by saying, and here's what I think we should do about these about these issues, or they yes. just throw off the road. No, I wish. <laughs> okay, that might be that. Does this person work for you? It works with me, not for me. With yeah. you, okay. Because that, to me, is the next phase in their development. Would be to learn in order to be a more effective person. I need to. Uh, I need to take this skill of mine, which is to see potential problems, which is valuable, and turn it into an asset by saying, you know, uh, by being able to say, this is what you do about it once you've re once you surface the problem. Right. Because otherwise, what this person is doing is just dumping something in your lap and saying, here's something that you need to figure out, you know, how to deal with. Uh, it, they're only taking sort of half of it. You know, they're, they're taking the first step, which is valuable, but they're not taking the second step. Um, I, I, I used to have a boss that says, don't come to me with a problem unless you also have a solution to that problem. So, uh, you know, don't just dump a problem in my lap, you know, come up with a way of, of, uh, of solving the problem as well. Anyone else? Well, just piggybacking on what you're saying, Sandy, I think the, the real challenge there is that that person is killing the ideation process because before you even have a chance to to get all your ideas out on the table, now you've got, no, that won't work. And so it's stymieing the willingness of a team to put out the weird, crazy, interesting ideas that might make an improvement. Um, that's a great point, Greg. And when we when we move into the group creativity and start talking about brainstorming, I'm going to, uh, to to emphasize that, right? Um, so again, you know, this person needs to be aware. You know that the person wearing those shoes needs to be aware that the ability to pro to identify potential problems is sort of a two-edged sword. It can be an effective, a good thing if you're actually 
bringing up things that we need to think about and consider, but it can be a bad thing if, you, if, it's, uh, if it's being used to sort of stifle creativity and stifle uh, discussion. Uh, so yeah, that's a great point. Um, we're going to learn a little bit about mind mapping. Uh, mind mapping is a great technique to help you generate ideas and, and change your perspective. Um, I've used, been using mind maps for about 15 years um, for different things. Uh, I like the mind map way of showing information because you can make, uh, you, you can make connections between things that you weren't, that you might not have thought were connected uh, initially. Uh, just be just in the way that you put your information out. And a mind map essentially uh, maps is a way of putting information and organizing information in a way that your your brain um, tends to organize it. Um, so the way that you create a mind map is the first thing that you do is you on a piece of paper or on like a PowerPoint chart or, or whatever, you put your main idea at the center of the map. So in this case, this person is trying to come up with a plan for their trip to Italy. And then the second thing is they you add the subtopics sort of around the core. So it starts in the middle and then it emanates out from the middle. So here are the things that this person needs to uh, to, to uh, have covered, take into consideration. Their flights, their transportation, the things to take, sightseeing, travel insurance, the hotel, and the passport, okay? So these are sort of all the categories that make up the trip to Italy. And then boom, you go and for each one of those, you lay out all the things that you associate with it. And the more that you do this type of thing, you start to see connections uh, between these uh, the relevant info that are in the different categories. And this is a really effective way to sort of map out a problem and the, the things that make up the problem and then your ideas to uh, address the problem. Uh, mind mapping is something that you can find a lot of good uses for. And it's, again, something that you can practice uh, the more that you use mind maps, the the more they'll become second nature to you. And if we were it together, I could do, we could do a mind map, um, a pretty a pretty uh, large and effective mind map. Um, but uh, there's plenty of resources out there to help you with mind maps. There's even software. I used to use mind mapping software that that. Um, that automatically could generate mind maps for you. I, uh, right now, it's really easy just to use PowerPoint uh, or something like PowerPoint to develop these. Have any of you used mind maps before? Has anyone seen mind maps before? Hmm, I'm getting a lot of no's. That's surprising. Um, can you, can anyone, uh, okay, Desiree and Maxine have seen them before, yeah. Uh, Desiree, how have you seen them used? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I was with Department of Health before I was with Doors, mm -hmm. and um, we had to partner with all of the organizations, you know, within the city as well as the state. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we, we were given information and it was on a mind map. And I found them very helpful because it was like getting very concise information, you know, that of course had been research based mm -hmm. to try to implement changes within our organization. So it, and I'm a very visual person. Yeah. So this tool was great. And I was part of a multidiscipline team. So, everyone could relate and understand, you know, even if we weren't face to face, you know, we could refer to the mind maps. So I find them very helpful um, when you're trying to implement change and bring ideas, you know, to the masses that can be effective for all. 
Okay, thank you. Maxine, you said you've seen them before? Maxine, can you hear? She oh, no I, she, she still has she still has no audio. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, there, does anyone have any questions about mind maps? If not, I'm going to go to the next topic, and this is a fairly broad topic. We are going to work an example. <clears throat> um, this is, um, and oh, and just so you'll know, this is going to be an opportunity for you to use your workbooks. So have those at, at hand here. Um, so metaphors and analogies can be an extremely effective way of changing your perspective on a problem. And um, it's, it's part of a large um, family of creative thinking tools called forced connections. So first of all, a metaphor, it's a figure of speech that connects or compares two unrelated objects. And the syntax for a metaphor is the first item is a second item. So the examples here, his mind is a prison, my hamster is a king. And then you, you, you come up with, you know, how is my hamster a king? Why is, is, is my mind a prison? And then an analogy is a figure of speech that compares two unrelated objects uh, to show, in order to show a point of similarity. So in life, you need to take the old out of your backpack in order to put the new in. Sort through the tools you have, keep the ones you need, and leave room for the ones to develop. So this is um, this is sort of like comparing your mind to a backpack. Um, you know, there are things that you need, can get rid of. You can reorganize the, the the things that you have in there keep the ones you need and uh, create space for new things to come in. Okay, so metaphors and analogies help you create connections to things that you might not have thought are connected. Um, they help us view the concept to a different lens. And in forcing these connections, we create the opportunity uh, to forge things that are unexpected, all right? Um, if I drew part of a triangle uh, up on the board, you, your mind could understand what the rest of that triangle looked like. And it's because you can force this connection to, create, to complete it because um, your mind, that's how your mind works. Your mind can do that. Uh, metaphors and analogies paint a descriptive picture of a concept and it will help you generate new and different ideas, come up with things that you hadn't thought of. And it, it makes sure, you know, you also need in doing this, you need to make sure that your audience will understand the references that you're using to create the connection. So let's do a metaphor uh, to uh, practice this, okay? Where you have uh, two things that are seemingly unrelated. And I want you to pick two of these things that are seemingly unrelated, and then come, come up with a, a way to relate them. For instance, uh, using the syntax, the, the first item is the second item. So uh, you could say, love is a rock, and then explain why. Uh, uh, you could say uh, a sheep is a tuna and then explain why. So I want to give you a few minutes here to do this. Uh, pick two of them and then make uh, and then make a connection and then explain your connection. I want everybody to 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 do this exercise and then we'll go over individual results.
if you haven't seen, Julie just put hers, one of hers in the chat. So you can use that as an example. Sandy, did you want us all to do that or or not? If you want you can put it in your you can put it in the chat or when I prompt you, you can say it. Okay. Everybody really love is focusing on love. This is cool. They're a very loving group. This one time is money. <laughs> Okay, let's go through some of these and keep coming up with them if you're still working on them. Uh, Julie says, love is like a rose. It blooms over time. It opens up to more. Greg says, love is like a pig. Sometimes it squeals, but if you handle it right and get to the good parts, it's pretty tasty. Desiree says, love your heart. You must take care of your heart to stay well. Be passionate. Alan says, love makes someone the sunshine of their life. Nancy says, love is sunshine. It makes you feel warm. Amy says, time is money. Waste it now. Pay for it later. Jessica says, a radish is a home because they can both nourish and can be can both be bitter at times. Um, Alan says, a pig is like a radish. They both need dirt to grow. Uh, Nancy says, home is prison. <laughs> Strictly COVID speaking, because I feel trapped. <laughs> Time is a prison only if you get stuck in it. That's uh, from Maxine. Anymore? Sunshine is like rain. When it shines on you, you'll sweat. Time stands still for no one, unless you're frozen in a webinar screen. <laughs> oh, this is this is good. This is fun. Okay. So uh, give me some feedback on this. It just looks like it took a, a minute or so for people to sort of get, get a hang of this, but once you got started and saw what everybody else was doing, you were able to you know, proliferate a little more here. So how did this feel to you? Yeah, it's really neat to see how others think. It opens up creativity. And it's an icebreaker. <laughs> I never thought of this as being a potential icebreaker before. Uh, but yeah, you could use it as an icebreaker. <clears throat> how could you apply this to solving a problem? How can you how can you apply this to generating ideas? I 
I think this approach kind of opens up some of the limitations that you may self-impose. So if you can start creating comparisons, it really helps you clarify the understanding of the problem and the situation and makes it more understandable and relatable to others. Yeah, Greg, that's that's where I'm headed. Um, Julie says it makes you think outside the box. <clears throat> when you create a metaphor, when you learn how to create metaphors and analogies, um, you say, you, for instance, you could say, what is this problem like? Or where have I seen this problem before in a different uh, industry or in a different organization? What is this problem similar to? And when you when you do that, it sort of forces you to change your perspective because you you know, if you can think about how this problem is like something else, you it now could open avenues that you previously didn't see for ways to solve the problem. Maxine says, yeah, this uh, helps you see others perspectives. That's good. I want to give you a uh, pro tip here. Oh, I did have. Uh, whoops, sorry. We went we went through the debrief, so I'm going to go ahead and move to this. So here's a pro tip I want to give you on metaphors and analogies, and this is just the general tool that I use for force connections. Um, any two concepts can be connected. And in order to, to do this, uh, a, a good systematic way of doing it is to write the two concepts, write the two words side by side, and then write a list of words or phrases that you associate with each. And then you can use these lists of words now to clarify your connections. So two of the words in there were tennis and blood. So what are the things I associate with tennis? Individual competition, it's fast paced, it involves both men and women. It's played on asphalt, grass or clay. Uh, I usually see in them in sit single elimination tournaments. It's an international sport and it's associated with big money and prestige. And then blood, it's red, it flows in veins and arteries, it carries oxygen, you can't see it normally. It's, uh, you, you associate it with war. It flows when you're cut and it tends to be gory. You know, you see blood in horror movies, it's in, in gorses. And the connection I made was between asphalt and flows when you're cut. So tennis is blood when you dive for a ball and scrape your knees on the asphalt. So I'm able to create a connection just by um, listing all of the things that you associate and then finding a, sort of a deeper, uh, a deeper way of, of making that connection. So do you see that? You think you could use this? You think, uh, how, would you, how would you use force connections in, in what you do right now? Can anybody think of an application? Jamie said, working with some coworkers. <laughs> I, I use this a lot when I, um, well, I'll give you a more concrete example. Um, I do currently a lot of um, basic training in how to use uh, Teams. Mm -hmm. And um, I use, kind of funnily, uh, the idea of a backpack of how Teams is structured. And I mm -hmm. use that analogy so that, that pe because the, the structure of teams is foreign to most people, so I use something that is more commonly known, sort of uh, the backpack and the old fashioned school notebook to make the mm -hmm. comparison and help people connect how to move through teams with something they're familiar with. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Uh, when I talk about teams with people, I use uh, the analogy of just like, uh, how is our team like a football team or how is our team like uh, a, a platoon, uh, a military platoon, or how is our team like a surgical team? 
And the way I use it to make connections is to think about how, you know, do we have a common goal? The football team has a common goal to score points. Do we have a common goal? Are we interdependent upon one another? The way a football team is, the the tailback depends on the lineman making a block for them to be able to run through a hole. Uh, the quarterback depends upon the receiver to run the right route, and the receiver depends on the quarterback to make a good throw. The quarterback can't be successful unless the receivers and the lineman and the tailback is successful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And and I think that's a really good analogy to make when you, you know, you're talking about teams is think about how other teams are successful and then figure out how are we like them and how can we be a better team if we use those principles. And Nancy says, uh, to get people to understand what you're conveying in a way that they, they might relate better, that's good. Let me go through here. Greg says, working with clients as well, it helps build connections between concepts and makes ideas more relatable. Excellent. It shows the, the Desiree says, it shows the pros and cons when seeking employment with consumers who are really not sure, who are not sure if they are really ready to seek employment. Excellent. Okay. Let's move on here. Situation and solution reversal. Um, you ask, how could I cause the problem rather than how do I prevent this problem? How do I achieve the opposite effect rather than how do I reach the goal? So in doing this, the situation role reversal technique enables you to change your perspective because it's for sometimes it's a lot easier to come up with ways of doing the opposite, especially if you have a very positively framed goal. Um, it, sometimes it can be very much very easier to come up with ways to fail than to succeed. And then you simply do a reversal. Um, this is this is a little bit like your challenging assumptions uh, technique that we learned in the problem finding uh, session. You look to achieve the opposite, and um, then you flip it around, and it, you can generate new ideas. So the way this works is you first thing you do is you identify the problem. Then you reverse the problem by asking the two sets of questions. And then you brainstorm as many answers to the questions posed as possible. You reverse all the ideas into solutions to your original problem. And then you assess your solutions. Are any of these are any of these viable? Okay. So, an example: How do we inform our customers about the new about the new layout of the monthly bill in the effort to increase customer satisfaction? You flip that to: How do we keep our customers in the dark about the new layout of the monthly bill in the effort to decrease customer satisfaction? So, some ideas that you could have, excuse me, on how do we keep our customers in the dark is to hang up on the customer when they call, be rude to the customer when they call, change the layout again to confuse them even more, and don't include anything extra in the next monthly bill to explain the changes. So, from that, you flip those and you say, Okay, so what we need to do is to be polite to the customer, be patient with the customer, assure, assure customers that this layout change will be in place for some time to come, and, it is, and that their department is doing everything they can to minimize confusion, and then assure customers that the billing department will be including some literature in the next monthly statement to explain the changes. So this is, a, again, this is a very systematic way of changing perspective on the problem. So let's try this uh, as an example here. Um, employees keep coming back late for lunch. Employees should be um, arriving on time. So we, we reverse that to say employees should continue to be late. So what are some ways, sorry, what are some ways that we 
can, I'm going to get out of this so that I can actually write down what you're saying here. What are some of the ways that we can uh, encourage employees to continue to be late for coming back from lunch? Remove all the clocks. What else? Avoid scheduling time sensitive events around lunch. What else? No time limit. Don't enforce, oh, I think I lost a couple here. Okay. Don't enforce timekeeping. Don't define lunch. Think about some of the things that might be causing them to go back or to uh, to come back late from lunch. When I was when I was working in Edgewood, one of the things that drove our lunch uh, hour was availability of places to eat. So, the further you, the, in Edgewood, uh, all the places to eat are on Route 40. So. You had to drive off post to go to one of the places on Route 40, and then you had to drive back. Oh, I already got that. Anybody have anything else? I'm going to add one because this this came up a lot. Force people to drive long distances to lunch. So then we have no deadlines. Does it matter? Set a bad example. Man, you guys are coming up with a lot. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop with these so that we can, in the interest of time, so that we can now do a reversal. How would we reverse these? Put clocks everywhere. See you, Nancy. Sorry, I have to leave.
How do we flip the uh, void scheduling time sensitive events? Delete the word avoid. <laughs> so how do we flip the no time limit? Here's, use a time clock. Wow. How do we flip the don't enforce timekeeping policies? Some of these are kind of self evident, aren't they? Yeah, remove don't. I'm sorry? Remove don't. Remove, I'm sorry, you're, you're cutting out there. Remove the word don't. Ah. Don't define the lunch hour and remove the don't. How do we reverse this one? Force people to drive long distances to lunch. Bring lunch. No deadlines. This one is another one. You just remove the word no. Break time doesn't matter. How do you how do you reverse that? Manage Start break times closely. Huh? Monitor break times closely. I said manage, but yeah, same thing. Okay. Okay, there's I, I see kind of two ways of approaching this. Does giving ample break time make it more or less likely that people will come back from lunch on time? Uh, you know, how does break, how do break times figure into the whole lunch hour scheme? Oh, uh, an alternative to that then would be break time from care or from Denise. Break time not added to lunch time. And then set a bad example yourself. How do you flip that? Do as I say, not as I do. Be an example. <laughs> okay. So, um, this one I felt was that you guys responded to like a lot easier uh, than some of the other ones. I think this one was kind of direct. Can you think of a way to apply this in what you're doing right now? Is this a tool that you think you can rely on? Is this a tool that you think you can use? I think we're going to use it a bit in, in a later example here. Um, so, those were the the five tools um, that we um, that we went over: the RAP model, the shoe swap model, mind mapping, metaphors and analogies, and situation reversal. So, do you have any questions about these? Yeah. 
Any questions? Because if not, I want to move on here. Um, we're going to now move to the next session, which is encouraging creativity in a team. And we're going to look at four of them, uh, brainstorming, role storming, brain writing, and slip writing. I think the only example we're going to have time to work through is the brainstorming. Um, but um, the, these are four group creativity tools, but any just about any creative thinking technique for individuals can be used with groups so the 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 five that we just went over it's good for individuals but you can also use them in a group um the first one is brainstorming and brainstorming i i um my perspective on brainstorming is it is easily it is easy to do brainstorming wrong or ineffectively, and it's kind of hard to do it right. Um, it was create it's credited to a guy named Alex Osberg, and he published it in a book in 1953 called Applied Imagination. Uh, brainstorming can be an individual activity or a group discussion. I prefer it as a group discussion because. <clears throat> when you do it as an individual, it can be effective, but it takes out one of the components uh, that make brainstorming effective. Um, and let me explain that a little bit here. Uh, brainstorming actually is a three role activity. And it involves three entities here, the owner, the brain power and the facilitator. So the owner is the person who owns the problem. They're the one who can define this is the problem that we're going to be um, dealing with today. The brain power is the group of people who are assembled to come up with ideas. And then the facilitator's role is to lead the process. They own the process. They know how to get you from where you are to where you want to go. They are not part of the brain power. The facilitator does not generate ideas. The facilitator manages the process. The owner and the brain power generate ideas. And in a group, what makes this effective is that you get to see and hear people's different perspectives as you're going through in a way that helps you build upon one another's creativity. This is the component that is lost when you're doing this individually. And one of the roles of the facilitator is to create ground rules. So as a facilitator, I would say, everybody's going to contribute in this session. And in order to, uh, to avoid the, uh, the hat of the person who, uh, or the, the shoes of the person who always throws up roadblocks, I want you to suspend your judgment. No roadblocks right now. No idea gets criticized no matter how unconventional it is. Uh, you know, going back to, Mon or to when uh, Friday when we we're talking about that crazy idea. You want to encourage crazy ideas when you do a brainstorming session. You want to encourage the unconventional because part of the job of the group is to take the unconventional and make it conventional. Just like we went from the Wheaties boxes jumping off the shelves into the person's basket to the person picks up the Wheaties box, looks at the cool video, and then puts it in their basket. That's how you get from something crazy to something practical. Also, go for quantity. The more ideas you generate in a brainstorming session, the better, because the more ideas you generate, the more opportunity you have for building on one another's ideas. And then one person speaks at a time. The facilitator really has to be uh, sort of quick on their feet so that they can capture all the ideas as they're being uh, done. So, we're going to do a brainstorming example here that's going to use a few creative thinking techniques. And I'm going to be the facilitator. And my problem is I want to come up with as many different uses for a brick. So imagine there's somebody, let's say that you were uh, the director of marketing and you, you're the person who owns the product problem. And you say, we need to come up with a lot of different uses for our bricks, the bricks that we make. And I want, I want, I'm assembling this team here to come up with solutions here. So 
what we're going to do, first of all, as a facilitator, I'm asking you just to give me every single uh, application for a brick that you can think of right now. Press flowers, okay? Building. Door Bookshelf. Stop. I'm sorry, what was that? Bookshelf. Bookshelf. Blunt object. Paperweight. Weapon. Pavers. Counterweight. What else? Bench. What else? Lighting. Divider, a flower bed border. Uh, seat warmer. Keep going. More, 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 more. Weightlifting. That's one no one's ever said before. So was seat warmer. Look at what people have already said. Can you build upon any of those? Can you make connections with any of those? Construction material. Patio. Wall, seats, art, okay, give me one more. Prop for cutting boards. Okay, I'm going to stop this right this second. So hold on to your ideas. And we're going to. Okay, so let's take a look at these. And what common themes do we have um, you know how would you how could we put these into categories construction okay, so one category would be construction one would be decorative decor. Okay, so let me give me a second here. Construction. Decor. Or just de like call this decorative. What other categories do you see in here? Comfort. Things based on the object being heavy. Uh, heavy. What other? What other categories do you see represented here? Creative. 
Okay. So as far as construction goes, what are some different um, different you different um, applications for construction that we haven't named yet? Design. Okay. Retaining walls, car pad. Okay, what else? The main thing I see missing is the bids for the person that's going to do the actual development, uh, the company or something, we have to obtain the bids. I'm, well, let's, let's just limit right now to the, the use for the bricks. Oh, okay. What other construction Any kind of platform, stage, something like that. Okay. What about fireplaces? Okay. What about different um, decorative uses? Mosaics. What else? Um, I'm sorry, I was listening and not reading. Playhouse down here. And blacks backsplash. Any more creatives? If not, I'll move on. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, you could do you could do a common theme drill down with each one of these, but in the interest of time, I want now to focus on. What are some of the attributes that you associate with bricks? And I think you just mentioned heavy. What are some other attributes of bricks? Hard, durable. Retaining. Rough material. A rough exterior. They come in. They come in different colors. Inexpensive. Any other properties? Uniform. They come in different sizes. <laughs> I got two. Diff the uniform shape and they come in different sizes. They're okay. Porous. Hmm? They're porous. That's right. They soak up water, don't they? Okay. Based on the properties that you see here, can you come up with uh, further ideas? Sometimes the facilitator will will need to prompt you to do something very specific like hard. What are some of the what are some other ideas based on the the attribute of the brick being hard? Or ah, I see one here. Hope you do too. Heat retaining. 
what are some of the what is what is a uh, what would be an application of bricks for heat retaining? Fireplaces, insulation. You've got you got fireplaces. So you said insulation. What else? I'm picturing it in my head. The fire pit. Okay. Fire prevention. What's an application where retaining heat would be extremely important? Ovens. Any others? So we could go through each one of these and, and develop even more and more and more ideas. Now I'm going to do some force connections here. Give me some words that you would associate or some words or phrases you would associate with the concept of a road. Dirt. I'm sorry, bumpy. Smooth, Dirt. bumpy and smooth. What else? Dirt. Yellow. I'm sorry, what? Did you say dirt? Dirt? Okay. What else? Yellow. Yellow? Okay. What else? Gravel. Okay. What else? Think about what, what do ro what not just what roads are, but what do they do? Curve. Uh, lead lead you somewhere okay what are some words that you associate with nut words and phrases favorite snack <laughs> tough <laughs> allergies <laughs> What else? Crazy. Okay. Organic. Okay. So let's take, uh, the facilitator would probably uh, highlight a word and say, now, using the connect, using path, um, can you, you know, you know, just force your thinking to path. Can you make a connection between path and brick? That will give you an additional idea. Walkways, sidewalks. What else? Driveways. How about, um, <laughs> how about squirrel? Trap. What else? I have too many. Huh? I have too many in my yard right now. <laughs> Could you use bricks to do something about that? Feeders. 
She doesn't oh. want Peters, but somebody else might. Let's see. Let's pick another word here. Crazy. <laughs> Sculptures. Huh? Sculptures. Okay. In the interest of time, I'm going to stop us because I wanted to just show you sort of a how brainstorming is supposed to work. We start out with just initially getting the things that you would, uh, you know, just the things on your mind. These are just the things sort of at the surface of your thinking. Then we um, determine what the common themes from that initial brain dump are and use those themes to generate more ideas. So we could have gone through each one of these in turn to generate more. Then we break down the attributes of bricks, heavy, hard, durable. And then we focus you on what are some, uh, some specific applications of bricks for heat retaining, uh, for, you know, for the fact that they come in different colors, for the fact that they're uh, porous. You know, we could go through all of those. And then the force connections to get you sort of outside of the box. So we're going through a progression from sort of more uh, common and more adaptive to more innovative and analogous and metaphorical. And in doing so, we can proliferate more and more and more ideas. So how would you describe the process that we just used? Methodical, okay. It's really peeling back an onion, right? You're going, you're taking one thing and then pulling it apart and seeing how much deeper you can dig. Right. Green lighting, challenging, sporadic. The think back to what I said originally about sort of the rules here. Do we have a situation where we can maximize contribution? Do we have a, do you, did you find that in order to move forward, you needed to suspend judgment? How hard was it for you to suspend your own judgment? Because what people will do when they're coming up with ideas is they'll edit themselves. They'll say, okay, this is practical. And then they'll come up with an idea that they don't think is practical and they won't say it. So when actively suspending judgment can be very difficult. How hard was it for you to suspend judgment here? Were you thinking more practical? At the very beginning, were you thinking more practically? Anyone? It's easier to do this exercise with something like bricks, but I it would be a lot more difficult when you have people problems. Mm. Um, I think that, right. I think that if it's a, um, maybe a problem based, you know, an organizational problem, a people problem, the less practical the topic, the more difficult it becomes to suspend judgment. But in order for brainstorming to work properly, I want to emphasize this. That second bullet, it has to be present. And this is another thing that you need to practice. Practice suspending your judgment. Crazy ideas generate transformational uh, change. So, you know, put out your crazy ideas. You might even make sure that there's somebody in the brainstorming session who is a crazy idea generator who can sort of stretch the group. Um, so let's say that we've got just a big mass of ideas that we've generated from this. How could we add a convergence step to this process? In other words, how could we pick what ideas to implement? Uh, 
Well, I think you did some of that effectively when you started grouping them into thematic mm -hmm. areas. And then from there, it, you know, you can collectively talk about what are the most practical or the most useful or the most achievable, um, what would be the, the ones that produce the most meaningful results if they were achieved, right? And, and so that starts giving you ways to winnow them down. And I think you can also sort of remove the duplicates or consolidate the similar ideas. Right. So there's lots of ways to assess, you know, the ideas and, and develop them into solutions. Uh, I will, my observation about brainstorming is that it is often misused as an end unto itself, whereas what it really is, it's sort of the first step. It's the first step in a process and the process has to converge. You have to pick out things for implementation, and then you need to develop an implementation plan, or else the ideas are just sort of floating out there, and they're not they're not ever really put to good use. And this is one of the reasons that brainstorming has a bad name with some people. They think, oh, they're just going to ask us for our ideas, but they're not going to do anything with it. There needs to be something that follows onto this that shows that you're taking the ideas, you're leveraging people's creativity and you're putting them to good use in a way that actually fosters change. So what did you learn from this? Did you learn anything new? Did anyone learn anything new? Learn to respect others' opinions. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I also learned that, um, you know, I think in, in modern business today, we have a tendency to short circuit things like this to, to mm -hmm. sort of try to skip steps mm -hmm. and that, you know, maybe that's ill-advised and, and that process, um, you know, even, even if today we don't do, you know, two of the things that came out of brainstorming, they're still there percolating for, for later. Mm -hmm. Um, some of you say that it's hard not to edit yourself, and it is. It's it's something that you need to to build up the skill for. It's very difficult to suspend judgment and understanding of ideas of others who don't process like you. That's thank you, Jamie. Um, the facilitator can use multiple idea generation techniques. You know, uh, there's a way to get through a a brainstorming session in as little as an hour if you. Uh, use, you know, the proper uh, techniques and really leverage the creativity. And you can actually come up with a, an implementation phase sort of toward the end of it. It, it. it dovetails really cleanly into an action plan. Now, typically what we see is that in a brainstorming session, the yield is about 80% adaptive and 20% innovative. Um, in, and it can be done individually. Um, you know, you can use these techniques to do individual brainstorming. What you're missing is the opportunity to leverage others' ideas. Um, so that whole component of the, the value of brainstorming is taking out. But it does allow you to percolate an, uh, to percolate an idea. And a lot of times when you go through a session like this on your own, your subconscious will start working on things. And then maybe the next day, you will come up with ideas that you normally wouldn't have had just from going through this process. So we just did a brainstorming session, so I'm not going to do that example. Role storming is very similar to one of the things that we did on Friday. Um, it involves each member of the group taking on the role or character of another person. I'm sorry, it's something that we did earlier today. Uh, this is sort of like the the uh, the shoes technique uh, offers the opportunity to see things from a different perspective. And people, if they were able to do that, uh, might feel a little less inhibited. In the interest of time, um, I'm not going to go through this, uh, the example here, but in order to use this, uh, you get into character by asking yourself, how does my character view the world? So earlier, we, I was suggesting that um, you could take on the role of a famous person like Thomas Edison or, or uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. How does this person view the world? 
how would they solve this problem? Uh, what would their stance be toward the problem or situation? What would their attitude be? What would their approach be? And uh, it can really help you broaden your perspective if you're able to do this effectively. Um, if you're doing this in a group, be sure not to take on the identity of somebody in the room or someone the group is familiar with. You ask, allow group members to ease into the task and do what they feel comfortable with. Again, you know, suspend judgment. Don't be critical of the ideas. Um, so let's move on here because uh, we're getting, uh, I don't want to do this too much longer. Uh, so I know because I know you guys have got other things to do. Brain writing is a brainstorming technique for people who are more introverted. So if I'm facilitating a group, I notice that there are people who will speak. You know, we on Friday, we looked at that. The people who are more extroverted, their behavior in a meeting, they will be the ones who tend to lead the discussion. More introverted people will listen. Um, Brain writing is a way to leverage the creativity of people who are more introverted. So um, brain writing is like brainstorming, except it's not verbal. You write things down. So very similar to brainstorming, you get the problem. There's a statement of the problem. Uh, everybody gets a blank sheet of paper. And you essentially... Uh, do a session where you are taking the idea or the, the problem and you're each writing down ideas to address the problem. Um, and the way I like to do it is, is this. We will have a, um, a, a group of people sitting at a table. And if you've got six people at the table, you need seven sheets. And the problem statement goes at the very top. It works best when you have a different problem statement at the top of each sheet of paper. So you've got six people, you have seven problem statements. Each person gets a sheet to start with, and then one is in the middle. You, you take your sheet, you say, I say go. You write three ideas to address the problem then you exchange with the sheet that's in the middle. So there will always be a sheet in the middle. Then you take that, you write three ideas, and you exchange with the sheet in the middle. So as you do this, you will now get, your sheet will have other people's ideas on it. After a couple of rounds, you will get, um, you'll see the other people, the, the ideas that the other people put on the sheet. So now you can come up with your own idea, or you can build off of an idea that's already on the sheet. So it just sort of um, uh, snowballs. So uh, you put a limit on it, maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever, and then boom, 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 boom. You try to get as many ideas on each sheet, then you gather up the sheets, and now you have an extremely divergent set of ideas. And you can consciously think to apply these in such a way that you're stretching your thinking. Come up with crazy ideas, put the crazy ideas in there. You put a crazy idea in there, somebody builds off that crazy idea. Uh, thank you, Jessica, I appreciate it. And then you can combine this with brainstorming because if you, if you come out, if you get to the end of your brainstorming session, you go boom. We will pick the, the top seven or eight of these ideas, and then we'll, how do we implement them? You start with each problem statement at the top, and then you, boom, you rapidly create a, an implementation plan uh, at the end with a brain writing session. The slip writing technique is, again, like brain writing, except it uses slips of paper instead of sheets. And it can be used with groups of up to 5,000 people. So... When, you're, when you've got like a whole room full of people and you want to harness their ideas quickly, you just distribute sheets of paper, little slips. The best way to get the slips is to get a, a colored paper like blue or yellow or something like that, get like 500 sheet, a package of them, have the printer, chop it into eight pieces. And then you've got, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these little slips. 
you distribute a stack of slips to each person, and you rapidly get their ideas. And then people can go and collect the ideas and then post them. You can do it with post-it notes too. Um, so that people, you know, you could readily, you could put them on a wall or an easel and people could see them. So you essentially plan your slip writing session like this. How do I present the problem? How much paper do I need? How will I analyze the data? You introduce the problem, establish the goal, you collect all the ideas and then you group them just like we did and during the brainstorming session and you get feedback. And then I wanna do just very briefly to, to end this, talk about implementation. This is phase three. Um, to, to evaluate your ideas, you need to diverge you know, diverge or converge into a set of solutions. So you sort the solutions by category, you do the pros and cons, what do you like, what do you not like, and then you prioritize. You just put the ideas in order, um, get a consensus from the group. In the case uh, where you have a problem owner, probably the owner will select the options that they want to implement. Don't limit yourself to one option, have an array, so you're converging into like the, the ideas that have the best opportunity, the best chance of being viable solutions. And then you can also eliminate solutions that the group absolutely won't consider at that point. Then you need to have an implementation plan. What needs to be done? Who will do it? What resources? How much time will it take? Who can help us? Who do we need to bring in on this? Things like that to lay out who's going to do what, and making sure that this takes place. And then you can even put like milestones. Uh, when does this need to be done by? Do any of these or any of these dependent upon one another? Do we have to do this one before we do that one? Uh, like I said, doing a brainwriting session can do this rapidly. Uh, you could flesh out an implementation plan rapidly with a brainwriting session. And then react to what's happened, get feedback. You can also use a solution planning worksheet in order to flesh this out. Um, we don't really have time to do the last exercise. I, I, uh, I recommend that you do that on your own, but um, I wanted just to ask, you know, we're here, at all, it's almost 10 after 11. This is a good time to stop. So final, final call for questions here. Do we have any questions? Melanie had to break off. Any reactions, any comments you'd like to make? I think this is Greg. I think my biggest takeaway from this is that a lot about the creative process is really just letting go of the barriers that you always uh, keep up and, and the filters and just going for the weird, crazy stuff, and then, you know, seeing what sticks. Yeah. In my work with, with personality assessments, how I, how I sort of express that is that who you are as a person both enables you and limits you. So your, your creativity that, that comes from who you are as a person enables you to be very successful in some areas, but then it also limits you in other areas that are sort of outside of your comfort zone. And then learning how to both stretch your thinking to become more adept and build some skills at those areas outside your comfort zone and to harness the creativity of others who will might, you know, sort of uh, compliment you and uh, learn how to, you know, collaborate with people whose creativity is different than yours, uh, can be really effective and really uh, help you be a better professional. Anyone else have any uh, insights? Anyone? Well, if not, I would like to thank you uh, for participating 
And I hope you got a lot out of this. Uh, we, we covered a whole lot of information uh, between Friday and today. And, uh, you know, my goal was to help you stretch your thinking, um, to, to help you come up with ways to uh, change your perspective, to understand one another, uh, thank you, Louise. Definitely, I wanted you to uh, hide uh, to widen your horizons. Thank you, Julie. Um, and again, I'm going to resend that uh, feedback form. It's just a simple Google form, uh, and uh, I will send you the um, information about the five whys. And I will also, if you have anything specific you would like. Um, me to send to sort of follow up on this, let me know. Um, in the feedback form, you'll have an opportunity to ask me to set up a time to go over your disk and values report. Right, uh, Louise, I did augment the workbook with some stuff in the presentation. Um, if you would like, I can post you, we're going to have the video, but I can also post the briefing charts in like a PDF form, and we can you can download those if you would like, so that you can have a complete, or or you know you could go through the video again and, and write some notes, but either way, um, I'll, I'll provide that. There will be a video of this that we will post. I'll put it in YouTube, and uh, I'll send you the link so that you'll have something you you can refer to. So with that, I'm going to, are we limited as to when you can access the video? No, um, I just put it in my YouTube channel so you can view it whenever you want to. It'll be up there in, per in perpetuity. Any more questions? All right, well, thank everybody. Thank you all for uh, participating. I'm really pleased with the way you were willing to to do the uh, the exercises and uh, the the examples and uh, and uh, thank you again and uh, I look forward to working with you more uh, as we you know we'll schedule the next training. I will let since you attended this one, I will let you know when we do the next training uh, and what the topic will be if you want to opt into that. So with that, I'm going to stop the recording and